Oh, I uh, read a little blurb about the making of Thor Ragnarok yesterday, and the guy that uh, directed Thor The Dark World uh, was quoted as saying that uh, Marvel gave him complete freedom during the shooting of the film. And as soon as that shooting was done, they took the movie away from him, and he had almost no input in its editing or final cut. And then he added, I wouldn't wish working on a Marvel film on any of my director friends. So obviously he wasn't asked back for Thor Ragnarok. Uh, But they made a a short list of five directors, and they were all, I don't want to say nobodies because that's, overly negative, but they were all like untested indie directors. And uh, they had a meeting with each one of them and they gave them a list of 10 things that they wanted to cover in the third Thor movie. For example, you know, the Loki having assumed the guise of Odin. Another one was uh, Thor, um, you know, his relationship with his brother. Third one was Thor's relationship with Jane Foster. One that didn't get used was Thor discovering that he has a brother, Balder. Huh. Anyway, there were these ten things, and uh, they gave each one of them this list of ten things and said, "Do give us a proposal of how you would do the film, you know, touching on these things, and then, you know, that will determine whose vision we go with. And this guy, and I, I can't even remember his name, the the Kiwi director, Taika. Ty- Help me out. Do you know who I'm talking about? (laughs) I don't think I do. Director is Taika Watiti. So you can see why I wouldn't wouldn't have uh, uh, remembered his name. Uh, I was kind of horrified to discover he's younger than me. Whoa. Uh, But he has white hair. But anyhow, he came back and he had made a video with uh, music and drawings and clips from other movies covering like all the points of how he would approach this film and uh it so blew the the marvel guys away you know that they're just like well absolutely okay yeah you're hired and uh they gave uh him the directing job and uh, had the screenwriters go to work with this guy to develop the movie that he wanted to make but yeah, the, the the thing that just blows me away is that he's, I mean, he's not just an indie director, but he has made two other films, Hunt for the Wilder People, okay, <laughs> and What We Do in the Shadows. And I've heard of What We Do in the Shadows, but never seen it. But I'm just, that's extremely obscure, this guy. And yet they gave him this pretty much tentpole film. Mm-hmm. With a gargantuan budget, I, I guess it was based on how blown away they were by his vision of the movie. Anyhow, I just thought thought that that was interesting because you know we don't usually see how the sausage is made. Interesting stuff. And anyway, unlike Alan Taylor, that's his name, the guy that directed The Dark World, uh, he he said I would be thrilled to come back and work with Marvel again, and he he would hope that there's a fourth Thor movie, but he said that he would do anything with the Marvel people, and he he pitched a short film that's the adv- further adventures of Korg and Meek, <laughs> and uh, Kevin Feige passed on that, saying it was not feasible due to Marvel's commitments of producing three feature films a year now. But it's a short film. Couldn't they make it like a extra thing on the DVD or something? Well, they used to. They used to make those Marvel one-shots. Yeah. But they've completely abandoned those, I guess, because of time constraints or because... I, I mean, I don't know. I thought those were neat, and I wished that they had released those theatrically before movies like the Pixar shorts. But there hasn't been one since 2014, it says, so... Anyway, maybe that's boring to you, but... uh... No, that was interesting stuff. Oh, you know, he did make two short films during the production of Thor Ragnarok. uh, The Team Thor shorts that were on, it says, Doctor Strange and Civil War. Did you see those? Huh. 
which are they're like mockumentary things of Thor moving into a, an apartment in Australia with and and with roommates and stuff. Do you remember that one of the roommates goes in to use the toilet and Mjolnir is sitting on the toilet seat and he's like, "God damn it, Thor!" <laughs> he can't lift that, the seat because the huh? that does sound familiar. Some of that. I, re- I mean, uh, maybe I'm mixing it up with the ones where Thor, they're like, what has Thor been doing in between the Avengers movies? Yeah, I think that's what they are. And it has the one where he's like living with his, like some roommate. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I'm just remembering it wrong, probably. Are you, are you rolling? Shoot, I've been rolling all this time. Sorry. All right, should we start? Sure. That is my goal. What the hell, man? Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. And welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. Today we're going to uh, talk about a movie that we saw over the weekend. Since talking about movies is one of the main things we do on That Gets My Goat, we decided we'd do it. So tell them about the movie that we saw, Rish Outfield. What was it? It was Thor, colon, Ragnar- Ragnarok. Oh wait, it was what? Oh shit. I Oh, what did you go see? I went and saw... Boo 2, a Medea Halloween? Oh. Crap, I thought that was the big movie of the... So it, that's not what we're supposed to have seen? Uh, you know, we, we can go with that. Uh, how was it? Uh, let's just talk Ragnarok, and I'll, I'll try and limp along. How's that sound? Uh, okay, yeah. I, I, I think, think that works. <laughs> it's probably for the best. I, I, I imagine there are a lot of parallels... A lot of similarities. Yeah, yeah, probably. (laughs) The character of Medea and the character of Hulk are probably really aligned. Really similar. Mm Mm-hmm. From what I can remember of uh, what Hulk was like way the hell back when they last had him. When was that? Two years ago? Yeah, in uh, Age of Ultron. Was that two years ago? (laughs) It was two years ago. (laughs) It seems like ten. This movie, um, it was interesting. I mean, this felt really tied in to other movies Uh like it expected you to have seen not only thor one and two but avengers age of ultron doctor strange civil war is there one i'm forgetting i i had actually forgotten doctor strange's little appearance in there oh so that was a surprise to you yeah when uh loki disappeared i didn't immediately put two and two together but my uh my cousin who i saw the movie with recognized the uh, the effect yeah the the magic yeah and, and see that was really strange the i mean no pun intended sorry um <laughs> how powerful dr strange had become in this movie maybe i don't remember dr strange all that well but it it seemed like he was at the same level as loki in magical ability and i i just remember him sort of learning in the in, in his own movie yeah, in his own movie, he was pretty new, but uh, that's one of those things that always happens in movies, though, you know, you, you, somehow they, it just clicks or something, you know, they're like clueless, and then boom! Oh, wow, now I am the greatest, I am the Quetzalc Heterock, or whatever. <laughs> well, see, I would have enjoyed a little bit more of a journey with Doctor Strange, you know, of him developing... Because it it seemed like he was the Sorcerer Supreme in this movie. He had taken over the Ancient One. Right. And maybe I'm wrong, but it's just... Uh, I mean, in the Marvel comics, Doctor Strange is insanely powerful. But I figured they'd give him a ways to go before he got to that point, since he's a new character. Right. Uh, you know, it's been, what, a year since that movie? Yeah, it's it's been about a year. It was November it was of the last year. November release last year. Okay, so yeah, I mean he's totally he's been reading up on all those books and using his photographic memory to just always be able to see them in his mind. So yeah, he's jumped a lot forward. Well, he now wears gloves, and I think that represents a, a quantum leap forward in his ability. Yeah, gloves do usually represent that. So that is understandable. So yeah, it, it definitely was 
very tight end. I'll have to I'll have to agree with that. Which I don't know. What did you think of that? Does it, does that make it cooler, or does that make it? Oh yeah, they had to do that because. No, to me it made it so much cooler, and and but but that's the thing that I have loved about this whole idea of a shared universe is that it rewards you if you see them all, and it rewards you if you pay attention. And there were a couple of moments, like when Thor says to Hulk, the sun's getting real low, or whatever, whatever the spe- the uh-huh. mantra was from the beginning of Age of Ultron that was supposed to calm Hulk down so that he could become Banner again. When he said it, I was just like, oh yeah! Because I haven't seen Age of Ultron since the theater, um, right. And so I had sort of forgotten that, but I thought that that was really neat. And then when we get the 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 message from Black Widow on the Quinjet, I was just like, "Is that from Age of Ultron, or did they have her shoot this for this movie?" And you know, I just i I didn't know because it's been long enough on Age of Ultron. I remember her sending the message saying, "You know, we can't track you in stealth mode." But uh, yeah, I remember that part, but yeah, I can't remember if that's the same thing or if they shot it from different angles or. But uh, see, that sort of thing is really cool when you've got a character like Thor or like the Guardians of the Galaxy that are out on another world or in another galaxy. You don't have to be tied in with the rest of these Earthbound movies, but the fact that they chose to have it this tied in. And talk about the the other movies. It's just a, I don't know. It's a reward for those that have seen all the movies or that were paying attention. And maybe it's an incentive for people that haven't seen them all or people to see them again. And I think that that's really cool. There was a, a deleted scene in Spider-Man Homecoming where they're on the bus, Peter and his friend... And the Ned and the awful girl are on the bus, and uh, they're passing the uh, the ruins of the Shield headquarters that had the cool name. Uh, oh, the Triskelion. The Triskelion, yeah. And Ned says, you know, oh, they're still fishing out pieces of the the helicarriers from the water there, and I was just like, oh, neat. I mean, it adds nothing to the movie. But it's just a <laughs> reminder that it takes place in the same universe. Right. And it gives you a timeline a little bit, too, which I think is neat. Anyway, I just I thought that that was really cool um, on this movie's part. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, that's the whole purpose of doing a shared universe is so that you can do this kind of stuff. And, you know, there's been a lot of times where I feel like they could have done more here and there where you're just like oh it should have been this or this should have happened usually that comes from the the tv's shows and the movies not working together which kind of bums me out when that happens like uh uh, i was really sad that uh we never saw the uh, dude who was the keeper of the books in dr strange show up and take that what was it called? It wasn't called the Necronomicon, but whatever the book was that they had. Yeah, there was an evil book. Yeah, in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And yeah, I just I just kept wanting that, that guy, guy to just show up and be like, I'll take that. Wong, right? Isn't that... Wong, yeah, I think his name was Wong. And um, yeah, I don't imagine it would have cost much. Ironically enough, the actor is Benedict Wong, who plays Wong. Oh, well. Wow. I don't think it would have cost Benedict a fortune to have him show plays, up. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Plays the character of Cumberbatch. <laughs> but anyhow, the, just like when Banner first shows up and he, he asks, did we save Sokovia? I don't know. That's just really neat. They're, they're keeping track of what's been going on and, and they want you to keep it all in your mind. Yeah. And I can see a certain portion of the audience hating that. Saying, oh, come on, you know, you're making me do homework. You know, I don't want to have to remember things. <laughs> um, or the ones that didn't see the other movie who are like, what the hell is he talking about? They're nudging their significant other saying, what is he, what is Sokovia? What is that? Why is she, why does he keep saying the sun's getting awful low? <laughs> but, I mean, I, I find that if you're a comic book fan, 
you do enjoy that kind of stuff because you are detail oriented. The comics were super, uh, I don't want to say incestual, but that's the word I'm going to use. You know, with crossovers and this referring to this, and especially in the Marvel Universe, them taking place in the same city and several of them knowing each other, and somebody showing up in somebody else's book as an attempt to get you to buy more comics. Right. And I assume, basically, it's the same thing here. It's an attempt to get you to watch all the movies, not just the ones that sound good because the commercial is great. Instead, you're like, oh, if I don't see this one, then I won't know what happens in this one. But see, like, Doctor Strange's appearance in this movie, it was totally unnecessary. Right. But I dug it anyway. And it, again, it's just, uh, they did it because they can. <laughs> in the same way that Spider-Man Homecoming had all those Captain America PSAs, the movie would have been just fine without any of those, but it's just a reminder of the greater universe, and it's amusing as hell to see Captain America talking about STDs or whatever he was talking about. There. So, you had your first wet dream, have you? <laughs> Believe me, I know all about the body's <laughs> changes. <laughs> I think that's actually from the movie. It's just like, nobody knows better than I do about a changing body. Anyway, kudos on that, because I got a kick out of every single time there was a reference. And uh, Tony Stark was not in this movie, but there were many references to Tony Stark. And just a reminder that he is out there and that he is part of this universe and that they all know each other. Yeah, he got to wear his clothes. <laughs> that was a Duran Duran t-shirt. Yeah. I don't know why disguise. that amused me, but it did. I recognized that shirt, too, and I just thought, oh, it doesn't seem like what Tony would wear. Yeah, yeah, Tony is always in the suits, the super nice suits. One of his suits costs what you and I make in a year, but I guess Bruce Banner would look fine in a suit, but he looks super weird in 80s club garb. <laughs> so there was a bunch of different things in this film. The movie was called Thor Ragnarok, but basically enfolded within this was a portion of the storyline of Planet Hulk. Now, you have read that series, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. I love Planet Hulk. Okay, so what did you think of the inclusion of Planet Hulk in this? Well, it was no surprise to me. That, that had been rumored as soon as they mentioned Hulk was going to be in this movie. It had been rumored that they were going to adapt to the Planet Hulk story. You know, I, I was a little bit bummed about that at first because Thor didn't participate in Planet Hulk. It was a Hulk story with a bunch of new characters that were really cool. But yeah, Hulk was at the center of it. But because there's never going to be another Hulk movie, they were able to have their cake and eat it too. I mean, they shifted the focus onto Thor... But for a good 35 minutes, we get our Planet Hulk storyline. It was just so fun. The, I mean, the whole, the whole movie was fun. The Sakaar planet stuff was particularly colorful and joyful and just kind of a crowd-pleasing. It's out of a totally different movie. Uh-huh. How faithful is all that stuff? Like, I, I haven't read it. I know Hulk goes to another planet, and he's a gladiator, and he becomes like the greatest. And I mean, it's not faithful they, as far as story goes. Right, um, but like, but they had the the planet Sakar, and they had they gave them obedience discs okay. that they couldn't remove, and they were forced to fight in the gladiator. The Grand Master. Grand Master is not in it. Grand Master is a much, much, much more powerful character in the comics. He's like Galactus level. He's, uh, you know, an immortal being with blue skin who loves to pit superheroes against each other and things like that, um, just for fun. Okay. It was much more of an adaptation of Gladiator, the Planet Hulk comics, and the Red King was the bad guy that, you know, they had to fight to entertain. But Hulk made a bunch of friends amongst the gladiators and among them was Korg who is a rock man and Meep uh -huh. which was this creature that looked exactly like he did in the 
in the comic or sorry in the movie he looked exactly the same and he if hulk falls in love and uh i mean you get the impression that he's on this planet for a long time i think it was a 10 issue or eight issue series just fantastic art just my favorite hulk story that i've read was planet hulk and eventually yeah there is a revolution and they turn against the red king and uh win their freedom and he comes back to earth with the war bound with this group of gladiators that he fought side by side with which i thought was interesting but it, yeah they just they took the idea they took the concept and planted it in this movie which is much more about thor and i, I was telling you before we started recording that uh Marvel Studios had these 10 ideas of things that they wanted to cover in a third Thor movie. And you can see that because there are several different storylines going, such as Thor and Loki dealing with, you know, their unfinished business and, you know, can they work together? Can Loki ever be trusted? You know, Thor and his father, uh, Hela, obviously, the sister he didn't know he had, the, the main bad guy, uh, insanely powerful bad guy. I, mean, I'm, I don't think we've ever had anything as powerful as Hela in any of these movies. Am I wrong? I don't think so. I mean, at least they never came across as being that way. I've heard that uh, Ronan the Accuser, or Ronin or whatever, I don't remember what his name was, but I've heard that he's supposed to be way more badass than he ever came across in Guardians of the Galaxy. And of course we've got Thanos just sitting around on his throne. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they depict Thanos and if he is as powerful as as Hela. I mean, she was, I guess we had talked about her for a few minutes. As far as I can think of, she's the first female villain in one of these Marvel films. Uh, I mean, I guess you could say Nebula, but, or you could say Scarlet Witch in age of ultron but uh but yeah they didn't stay that way but they've never had a main female bad guy and she looked super cool there was a lot of character with her um she was kate blanchett so i'm not going to complain there <laughs> she was scary dude I, I i really enjoyed that you know when she first shows up and she's got like the i want to say like running mascara around her eyes but it's just i don't know soot or something (laughs) and she's got like veins in her shoulders and that and the first thing she says is kneel um i don't know it's just like wow this she was particularly scary i thought yeah yeah she was really it's interesting because i apparently you're a fan of kate blanchett i don't know that i've ever seen her in much but i've never been particularly attracted to kate blanchett i'll say but I was in this one. I don't know if it was just me that noticed this, but it seemed like she did a lot of walking with a lot of <laughs> swaying in that really, really, really tight outfit that she had on. Is it, is it just me or did you feel the same way? That, did you notice that as well? Well, there was a sexiness to the character, but I didn't feel like it was about that. No, um, no. Yeah, definitely not. Um, I, I'm not sure that we were supposed to be attracted to her. You know, I think probably her most famous role in the past was Galadriel in the Lord of the Rings movies. And in that, you know, she was like the most beautiful being in Middle Earth, but she was a- also scary. Right. I mean, especially in Fellowship of the Ring. Holy yeah. crap, man. And yeah, th- th- there was a little bit of that of the dark Galadriel in Hela. Mm -hmm. But I I just, when she steps out and she's got the hair down, I mean, yeah, she looked like, you know, the evil goth chick at every high school, (laughs) how they wish they could look. Uh I don't know. I got the impression that Blanchett was having a good time playing that role. Mm Mm-hmm. I thought it was well done for sure. I don't know. I, uh, we're we're not really talking about the story. Sometimes we'll sit down and we'll just go through the story. And, you know, Thor is in a cage. And, yeah, it turns out he's in the land where Surtur lives, the, the underworld. And 
And we go through the whole story and we just sort of comment on, oh, I liked this part and oh, about this part. In this one, I, I don't think we're doing that. But the, the, the movie covered a lot of ground. I think there were probably two movies worth of story in Thor Ragnarok. Uh huh. I mean, just the Sakaar stuff could have been its own movie. And just the Hela stuff could have been its own movie. But, you know, we get the death of Odin early, early on. And then Hela shows up. And that fight lasts no time at all. <laughs> She's just that powerful. And then for an hour or so, we're on Sakaar. And every once in a while, they'll cut back to Asgard to remind you what's going on with Hela. It's sort of a ticking clock kind of thing. Constantly reminding us of... Thor's homeworld, you know, being in trouble, and he needs to get back to that. But I think it's the Sakaar stuff, the stuff on the battle world or whatever you want to call it, that people loved in this movie. I mean, it was certainly the stuff that was in all the ad campaign. And we talked about it, gosh, I don't know how long ago, months ago, when we were talking about spoilers and we were talking about shitty trailers that give away too much, but there, there was no chance that reveal of Hulk wasn't supposed to be a huge surprise. Yeah, I know. It's unfortunate. I was thinking about that, you know. They got to get people to show up to go to the movie. And Thor 2 was, you know, uh, you, you and I, before we started recording, went through the list of all the Marvel films and where they fell in the uh, Rotten Tomato rankings. And I was guessing at them, and The Dark World was the lowest rated of all Marvel films, was it not? Yeah. So trying to come back from having the worst sequel to do well, uh, to, you know, to have a good opening, you got to do something, including The Hulk, you know, is a, is a good way because everybody loved The Hulk from the first Avengers movie on. And that's something that you can do to, to really pump up that movie. But <laughs> if it's a big surprise, I mean, it would have been way better if it was a big surprise for everybody. But if it was a big surprise for everybody, this movie would have made half probably what it, would, what it made on its opening weekend. And then would have, I don't know, maybe word of mouth would have brought people the, the later weeks. But more likely, it would have just, you know, slowly petered out and been a huge disappointment. So, sadly, they had to reveal that the Hulk is in this, even though, yeah, it, it was, you know, you didn't, they, the way they treated it, they never said the, the word Hulk. Um, they just called him the champion and all that crap until he actually bursts out. Yeah, Loki says, I haven't seen this champion, but I understand he's particularly savage or something like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all just dancing around that idea. And the Grandmaster says, you're incredible. And the door is open. Uh -huh. And then what would that have been like if you didn't know going yeah, in that, who was going to show up? That would have been pretty cool. Alas, that cannot be. But you're right. They had to include Hulk because that, I'm sure that element of Hulk put as many butts into seats in Thor Ragnarok as the inclusion of Iron Man in Captain America 3. And the whole ad campaign of Captain America 3 was Iron Man versus Captain America. And so, yeah, they just had a ton riding on it. It's a shame they couldn't keep that kind of thing a secret. But it worked. It worked out for them. And it had a huge opening. Thor 1, I think, opened in the 60s, 61 million, something like that. Thor 2 opened in the 70s, 72 million or something like that. Thor 3 opened for $122 million. So there you go. Apparently the movies have been really crappy this year and they've not made a lot of money and everybody's like, oh yeah, Thor Ragnarok is going to get movies out of their doldrums this week. Obviously, it's way better than its predecessors have been in the box office. Was it, was it gr as great as... I mean, I, I was telling you before we started recording that there were commercials that came out that said, Come and see 
the highest rated Marvel movie ever. I mean, that's what they were putting on the commercials, which that almost seems like just asking for it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we, we've talked about having the high expectations versus low expectations and how much you can enjoy a movie uh, sometimes, even if it's not amazing, as long as you don't expect it to be amazing. But if you put that on your commercial, everybody is going to expect it to be amazing. And if it's not 100% awesome, it could come back to bite you with bad word of mouth or something like that and ruin you after week one. But uh, do you think that it lives up to that? I mean, I, I guess it's now not the highest rated Marvel movie ever because it fell from 96 down to 93. Iron Man number one was at 94, so it's now second highest. Well, still, as of the time we're recording this, it's the second highest rated of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is impressive because overall, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been great. Yeah. But I'm glad that I didn't see that commercial. Because like you said, yeah, it can only set you up for disappointment. But, uh, you know, I just, I wish, and and for the most part, I've been able to avoid them. But I I, I want to avoid the commercials and the, you know, the trailers and the promotions for these things, for these movies that I'm going to see anyway. Right, yeah, I mean, you might as well avoid them since you're going no matter what. Um, And I didn't watch the last trailer for this. But I did see a TV spot a week ago or two weeks ago that showed Thor and Loki fighting side by side. And I felt like that was something I didn't want to see. I was just like, oh, <laughs> to know that they I, I didn't want to know whether they became friends or whether they were enemies. It, you know, it just felt like even that was too much. Uh-huh. And there were a couple of characters that I didn't know were going to be in this movie. And when I saw him, I was like, oh, hey, cool. When you saw Korg on there, you're like, oh, wow, Korg. Well, you may, I know you're joking, but I absolutely went, oh, wow, Korg, before he even said his name. Because, yeah, he's super recognizable. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was Korg sitting right there in that scene. Now, but look, can we talk about Korg for five seconds? The sure. voice of Korg. <laughs> what a weird choice, dude. Because <laughs> he's got this super high-pitched, weird... I mean, I'm assuming that's a Kiwi accent because it's the director's voice. Oh, is that who it is? Is the director doing it? He's got, just got this strange, silly way of talking, and it's a super jokey. And I, mean, I don't think that there's a single thing Korg says that's not meant to be funny. And I, when you see that character, you expect a totally different, gravelly, low pitched monster voice. <laughs> uh huh. That, to me, was funny, but it was constantly distracting to me. Yeah, it is a little distracting, because he's even in, like, the, the heat of the battle or whatever, he's always just like, hey, man. <laughs> hey, what's up? Here's a sword for your face. Yeah. Or whatever. <laughs> Maybe you and I can write a PSA with Hulk and Korg talking about... <laughs> like net neutrality or something like that. And we'll get, uh, I mean, although you sound like Korg to me, maybe you could be Korg, but I was going to ask Gino to be Korg. Cause I'm assuming that that's how Gino talks in real life. I mean, if you kick him in the jewels, that's how he talks. Right. Right. Yeah. So I have one other thing that I want to talk about, uh, about this show before we go. Oh, is it time um, to go already? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm at the limit of all I have. Because I actually only saw Medea uh, uh, Halloween. So all this crap, I've just been BSing the whole time. So. Oh, okay. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. How <laughs> did Medea 2 uh, hold up next to Medea 1? Boo. You know, they're both, they're both equally uh, garbage, I'm sure. But <laughs> what I did want to talk about was Mark Mothersbaugh. What did you think of Mark Mothersbaugh? <laughs> Mark Mothersbaugh did the score for, yes. for this movie. And uh, I know him from now, a rock band. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say you'd probably know better than me. What score is he most famous for? Is, is there a particular one? No, no, no I, I don't know. Okay. I know Mark Mothersbaugh as the lead singer of Devo. 
Uh-huh. Whip it. Whip it good. And, and nothing else? And nothing else. Yeah, I mean, I know him as that as well. I had a roommate in college who had a thing for Danny Elfman, Mark Mothersbaugh, and even Philip Glass. No! So he had a thing for weird soundtracks and soundtracks made by guys who were in bands from the 80s. I, I, would, I tried to look it up and see what uh, Mark... I, the whole time that we were watching this, it had a really electronic sound to it. I kept thinking, oh, what am I watching? Tron here? Or <laughs> am, am I watching Blade Runner? Am I watching, I don't know, Chariots of Fire? Uh, uh, I guess they did this a lot with movies in the 80s, like even The Natural, which was scored by Randy, Randy Newman, Newman, had this weirdly synthesizer-heavy uh, soundtrack, which is odd considering that it was a movie set in like the 30s. And I don't know what it was, but that kept pulling me. It kept making me think, this is weird. This doesn't <laughs> fit. Why are they doing this? Why, Mark Mothersbaugh, why would they pick that? It's not like, I, uh, I'm trying to think of a character where this kind of music would be, you know, some kind of robot character. Although there's hardly any robot characters in Marvel that aren't bad guys. Maybe if the vision had a solo movie, this would be the good music to put with it. But I don't know, maybe it worked. What did you think? Did you think it worked? Did it seem weird to you? Well, yes, it seemed weird, but a ton of stuff in this movie seemed weird, <laughs> and I felt it was intentionally so. And probably the best example for me in the whole movie is when Thor is being introduced to the Grandmaster, and they play the Fudgeon song from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory you know, the pure imagination song. And you get all these colored lights and a voice telling him that now you belong. You know, oh, the Grandmaster right. owns you. Where he's coming through that tunnel or whatever it is, and then he's like, ah! It was so effed up. And, but there was tons of that stuff in this movie, and I, I kind of dug on all of that weird... I, it reminded me a little bit of... Flash Gordon, the, the 80s, the, oh, he saved every one of us. That uh -huh. kind of thing, there was a campness to it. Right. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention the abhorrent Led Zeppelin song. Played <laughs> not only in the trailer, but played twice in the movie. That's right. The, 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 the heinous, the appalling <laughs> Led Zeppelin song. I the, I do not understand the, your problem with that song. The, is there a word worse than a, than the atrocious <laughs> Led Zeppelin song? See, yeah, that took me out of the movie because I just wished for death <laughs> for you know the entirety that those two the, the two times they played that song. So that, that maybe the effect of the weird synth pop maybe that that had that effect on you. Yeah, it was, I mean, it wasn't bad. It was, it just gives you kind of a weird feeling like you're, I don't know, it's like you've been sent to Cloud Cuckoo Land from uh, the Lego movie or something. Like all, everything is... Awesome? A, a little unreal. You know what I mean? Yeah, everything is awesome. <laughs> everything is cool when you're part of a team <laughs> like the Revengers. Sorry, guess who scored the Lego movie? Oh, was it Mark Mothersbaugh that did that too? It was Mark Mothersbaugh, yes. Interesting. So yeah, I think I got I think I got that soundtrack, and then I think I may have eventually deleted it because it just didn't. <laughs> Either that, or I just you know never listened to it again. I think I, I think I did get that once though. I found more joy in all the uh, various versions of Everything Is Awesome than I did in any of the score, unfortunately. Like the uh, acoustic version. There's an acoustic version of Everything Is Awesome. <laughs> yep. It's all really slow, and the, and the singer is, it's not even the same singer. It's just somebody going, everything is awesome. It almost sounds like a country song or something. Oh, okay, that sounds familiar. I do remember a country version. One thing that we always talk about when we do these reviews is the music, because you're a big score guy. And I got to admit, I appreciated them doing in this movie what we want them to do in every one of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Like when you see the Quinjet, 
they played the Avengers theme. And when Thor finally sits down in the chair that's, you know, for his throne, they play the Asgard theme from the first Thor. Yeah. Uh, And in the end credits, they had the Lonely Man, the the Harnell song from the (laughs) 70s Hulk. But I paid attention when I saw it again, trying to pick up on it. And I just, I didn't hear it. I assumed it played when Hulk became Banner again. But I just, yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear it. I didn't recognize it. Yeah. Anyway, I just, I thought that that was really cool. Um, yeah. I, I think is. they might have played the Doctor Strange music when he showed up, and it was on that weird instrument, the like on the sitar or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Or the harpsichord. I think harpsichord. They a ton yeah. Of harpsichord in in that soundtrack, if I remember. Yeah, I, I love that, and hopefully that's a sign of things to come. Maybe they've been listening to That Gets My Goat. Maybe uh, Kevin <laughs> yeah. Feige is one of the people who downloads. <laughs> and he's like, you know, these guys are right. What have I been doing? I've been squandering this opportunity. So that's my Kevin Feige impression. It's dead on. It's, it's, it's I'm really, really impressed. Yeah, spot you can do Korg and <laughs> Kevin Feige. but um, That's right, man. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> Make he's dead. <laughs> yes, the reviews of Thor Ragnarok were really, really good. But if there was a complaint about the movie, it was the tone. Um, that it was a very light, jokey, almost comedy movie. And I thought about that over the weekend, because I knew we were going to be talking about this, and I assumed you would like it, because you like that nauseating did i use nauseating that ghastly led zeppelin song yeah pretty much that's all you need for me to like a movie is to play that song in it there you go Uh, but i wondered (laughs) if i would have liked the movie more if it had had a more serious tone if it had had a tone more similar to the dark world's tone which yes I, i may be the only person on earth who liked thor the dark world but no, I liked it myself. Uh, if you go back to old episodes of That Gets My Goat, I preferred it to the uh, first movie. Oh, I still do. Yeah, I think the first movie is it doesn't entirely work, mm-hmm. but I liked the grim, dark tone of the second movie and the seriousness when his mother died. And I wonder if Odin's passing would have been more affecting had it had the movie been done in that tone. I mean, even the Hela stuff, she was always joking, and Thor bantered with her. So, I mean, even that stuff was light. Although, boy, she did impale a lot of people. <laughs> yes, every last one of our Heroes 3, or are they called, they're called the Heroes 3, right? The Warriors 3. Warriors 3. They're all gone. Yeah. Every last one of them died horribly. I guess Sif is still around because she didn't make an appearance at all in this film. No, that was strange. I guess she's involved in that NBC series Blind Spot, and it probably takes so damn long for them to cover her in tattoos that uh, she's unavailable to even do a cameo in this film. But they should have at least had a line or something. You know, when Thor... Like the Jane Foster line? Right. When Thor arrives at Asgard and Heimdall has been exiled or whatever, they could say, you know, that Sif has been as well. You know, she's been off planet for a year. She insulted uh, Odin. And that way, at least you have an explanation for why she's not there. Yeah, the Jane Foster line was, oh, I don't know what it was about that. But that's one of those things that I've always hated about Batman Returns. Batman Returns? Is... uh, the one line about Vicky Vale. Yeah, the one line, Vicky Vale. Oh, it didn't work out. <laughs> that's, that's seriously, that's all we get. Well, that's more than uh, we got in this, right? No, this one was in just this, oh it's yeah, a Jane joke. dumped you or something, and he says, "No, I dumped her." It was, he says it was a mutual dumping, and that's all we get. But yeah, it's I think the movie lame. is better without Jane Foster. Yeah, I, I don't think that we needed to have Jane Foster in this film or anything, but I guess maybe they were trying to open him up for, hey, maybe he wants to be romantic with the Valkyrie girl. Is her name just Valkyrie? Is that? That's the weird thing, is that's her 
uh, title. That's her p- position. It would be like having a character who is policeman, who is <laughs> janitor. But I, I, she had a name. It was Scrapper142 or something like that, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> and I think in the mythology and in the comics, the Valkyries each have names. The, the blonde, beautiful leader of the Valkyries is Broomhilda. Sweet. Uh, but I don't think that that's who she was playing. <laughs> Hilda. But it, and that, that shot that's... of the Valkyries on their Pegasuses, Pegasi flying in to fight Hela, just so cool looking. And it's all in like slow motion. It's just insanely yeah, beautiful. It was, there were three or it was four amazing. shots. I want to see. Like a, I want to see a movie that's just about Valkyries somehow because of that, basically. <laughs> Well, it's kind of a shame that they didn't get her another winged horse to ride. Yeah. Because, yeah, I kind of got the impression that Hela was going to ride Fenris, the black wolf, uh-huh. and that Valkyrie was going to ride a Pegasus, and they were going to have some kind of battle that way, but that didn't happen. No, just Hulk. <laughs> um, but do, you Hulk got the not. impression that Valkyrie was Thor's love interest in this movie? Because, weirdly, I thought that Hulk and Valkyrie had some kind of thing going on. And that when she discovered the whole Banner thing would be one of those, Banner's got a girlfriend back on Earth, but Hulk has a girlfriend on the spaceship or whatever. I, I don't know. I just, I thought that's where that was going. I don't know. He, he called her angry girl. <laughs> but I, I, you thought she's a Thor love interest. Well, there was uh, there was this very small amount of that kind of near the end, where she made a look or two that seemed like maybe she liked him. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, it was such a such a small amount that I don't know. I I just wondered if maybe they got rid of Jane so that they could leave it open so that you would feel some of that uh, tension or something. You know what I mean? Well, sure, and and that's fine. I I f- I found the character really interesting. She was layered i didn't like her at first and i grew to like her as the movie went on and yeah i'm glad they didn't kill her off or they didn't go their separate ways because i'm interested to see what becomes of her um although yeah she's so much more powerful than the other female characters that we've got in these marvel movies it'll be uh i guess it'll be fun to see her alongside black widow and Scarlet Witch and Gamora. I, I'm assuming she's in Avengers 3 because everybody is, right? Yeah, I don't know. That's the way it looks like uh, from what I've seen. P- photos from the set of like Spider-Man and Iron Man and Star-Lord all just hanging out together. <laughs> it's so. kind of strange we didn't get a trailer for that at the beginning of this. I, I expected that we would. Maybe... You have to the wait first until teaser of some sort. Yeah, it might be at Black Panther. Maybe it'll be at the beginning of Star Wars. But uh, it just seemed like a natural that you'd show a trailer for Avengers on this. But uh, the movie ends with with a trailer for that movie. <laughs> n- no, I mean I guess you could say that it ends with Thor and Loki on the that ship. Then a enormous ship shows up. I mean, uh-huh. I felt like it was pretty clear who's on that ship and why they ran into it. But when I talked to my nephews, neither of them got that impression. But my my thought was, Loki took the Tesseract. Yeah, he stops in front of it as he's walking past. And everything of Asgard is totally destroyed. Except for probably the Tesseract, which is in Loki's pocket or whatever. And so, yeah, my thought was... Thanos is there to get that that infinity gem or you know whatever you want to call it. And so I'm assuming Avengers 3 will pick up with that scene and we'll find out. I mean, I hope they don't kill off Loki, but knowing Loki, he might be like, "Oh, look what I brought for you, Thanos." Right. <laughs> and he's like, right. "I've been on I've been loyal to you all this time." I'm just I'm I'm happy they didn't kill off Loki. Because when they killed o- Odin off, and then immediately killed off Volstag and uh, Fandril, and then Hogan, I was just like, oh, okay, so this is the last Thor movie, guys, huh? 
And they're going to kill all <laughs> right. these dudes. It's like uh, that scene in uh, Serenity where Wash has just been killed. Sorry, spoiler alert if you haven't seen this very old movie. Um, and then everybody is there and they're all penned in. And Zoe is like, screw this. And she gets up to just like go and she doesn't care anymore. And all of the, everybody, it's uh, at a certain point, I'm like, they're going to kill everybody. Holy crap, Joss Whedon, you monster. <laughs> and yeah, I think that's, that's a lot of what you felt at the, at, in this film as they steadily are killing off everybody. The only person they left was Scourge. They did kill Scourge too. Yeah, in the end. Oh, I, and that was a character I did not know was going to be in here. Are you at all familiar with Scourge from the comics? No, he's a comic character then, I, I guess. Well, if, if you've got a computer in front of you, do a search, and you will be blown away how exact the look is. Because, yeah, I mean, before they even said his name, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Executioner, look at him. And uh, I didn't know, I knew Carl Urban was in the movie, but I, I didn't know who he was playing. And it's just neat that, like Hella, they poured it over his look exactly from the comics. Oh, yeah. Here's the picture of him. This has got to be a recently drawn one because he even looks like the actor. Well, I don't know. I mean, I've got a picture of him from the 80s here, and he still looks the same. Although, yeah, okay, there's a picture of him holding the two rifles. <laughs> I'm wondering if that is from the comics and they chose to put that in the movie. Or if, if that's an image. His, what, were the, what were the rifles named? Uh, Des and Troy. Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh, his name is spelled with a K. Yeah, oh, I should have told you that. Sorry, man. S-K-U-R-G-E. Scourge. Anyway, sorry about that. That was a, a... Not a segue. What do you call it? What I just did? Tangent. A tangent, yeah. But I think we've come close to the end of the episode... Uh, I complain to you a lot, and I know I've complained on every single one of these that gets my goats where we reach Iron Man 3 or Captain America 3 or Thor 3. Why do they have to end with three movies? I would be more than happy to see a Thor 4. To me, it's counterproductive to create fans of these characters and invest multi, multi millions of dollars. And then just say, you know, we have no plans to do another one. Uh, he'll just show up in other people's properties. I think there are more stories to tell with Thor and his group, especially how huge yeah, we this haven't group even is. met Beta Ray Bill yet. Oh, and did you see the visual reference to Beta Ray Bill? My cousin pointed it out I the didn't. first time it showed up, and I was just like, what? And then it shows up two more times in the movie. I was happy to see it, but they had the statues, not the, sta yeah, the, the, the Mount Rushmore on... Oh, uh-huh, on the building. On Sakaar. And they're building Hulk's tribute statue or whatever. But right to the, to the lower left of Hulk is Beta Ray Bill. Oh. And uh, it bums me out that that's probably the only <laughs> appearance Beta Ray Bill is going to have in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Unless they choose to do another Thor movie, I, I would really enjoy seeing Enchantress, and I would enjoy seeing Beta Ray Bill. I mean, I don't, I don't know the Thor universe beyond just the basic characters, but those are two characters I would really like to see. Yeah, it is a bummer, but I don't know. Uh, they don't have plans now. I don't know. It's, I guess, it's hard to say. How long can you go before it's, it's too long? You know, you have to switch out the actor for somebody else or something. I assume what their plan is, and I've talked to you about this before, I think, but I, I assume that, you know, Thor's going to appear in the Avengers movie and that he's going to make appearances in Black Panther 2 and Ant-Man and Wasp or whatever they're calling the uh, sequel to Ant-Man. And then he'll appear in... Uh, Doctor Strange 2 or something, you know, that you'll be getting them there is where they will show up. And you'll get the same thing with Iron Man and the same thing with Captain America because those have all reached their three. And I guess that's it for all of them. And now we've got the other ones that got to reach their three. And I mean, Ant-Man has already made appearances in other stuff. He was in that uh, Avengers... 2.5 movie. 
You mean Civil War. <laughs> yes. I think that's cool because the Marvel Universe is so vast, has so many characters, that it would suck if it was limited. If we're like, oh, well, yeah, but we're going to stick with just the Captain America stuff or just the Thor stuff because everybody likes those characters. So we're not going to branch out. I mean, we'll have to see what happens over the next little while. Got two more Avengers movies. We got Black Panther. We got uh, another Spider-Man. We got another Doctor Strange. We've got another Ant-Man. We've got Captain Marvel. All of these coming up. And it's always weird to me when those things arrive because they came out and announced them so long ago, it seems. But now I'm older and here they are. <laughs> I guess those will be here before I blink twice and uh, we'll be able to see just, you know, how, how good they are and if it was worth it or if, you know, the highest rated Marvel movie ever was like the start of the downturn or something, you know. I, eventually we're going to get some that aren't great. I mean, I mean, I guess maybe we've already got some that aren't great. But eventually I guess we're going to get one that's bad. Luckily... DC's cinematic universe was bad right out of the gate. And they're still making movies and there's still people going to them, so it's not the end of the world there. Yeah, it serves as a good foil. But yeah, I mean, we went through the list of all the Marvel Studios films. And of all those films, the worst one was Thor 2. And it was, what, a 60, like 6 or something like that? Uh, 66, I think, is what it had on Rotten Tomatoes. So, I mean, that might be a D grade, I guess. <laughs> but it's not an F, and it's not, you know, a 0 or way the heck down there. It's not a 17 or whatever it was that they gave to Suicide Squad. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a long ways from anything like that. Everything that you go to see is still at least fun. At least you're not like, oh, damn it. Two hours of my life, my shortening, ever-shortening life. I wasted two hours on this movie. I'm just going to end my life now instead. You know, you're not to that point yet, so that's good. You're not to the good dinosaur level yet. That I mean, that that is a good thing. That as long as Thor Ragnarok was that I wanted more when it was done. And uh, I felt like Hulk worked delightfully well, and I want to see more Hulk. So they really accomplished their goals if it was uh, to create a, uh, an enjoyable, satisfying movie and then leaving you wanting more of the same. Yeah. And, and yeah, it looks like this one's going to make way more money than Thor 1 and 2 made. And so maybe... Maybe they will pencil it in, a fourth Thor movie. Yeah. You think they might change their mind? No, probably not. Make because Thor 4. Because Iron Man 3 made more than Iron Man 1 and 2, and they never reneged on their idea of not doing any more Iron Man movies. So, we'll see. I don't know. Yes and no. I mean, they did do Avengers 2.5, and they put Iron Man and Spider-Man and... Basically using Iron Man everywhere they can. They are, and I, maybe I'll be satisfied if they do that with Thor wherever they can. I mean, we do get two Avengers movies within a year of each other, so maybe I will uh, get my fill of all of these characters. We'll see. Yeah. All right. I mean, I don't think we need to do a little thumbs up or thumbs down at the end of this. Uh, uh, considering it's the highest rated Marvel movie ever. <laughs> Stop saying that. Whatever we have to say about it is not going to have a uh, more impact than that. But I still would say go and see it if you haven't. Um, hopefully we haven't spoiled too much for you. But usually people don't listen to our shows about them until they have seen them. But if you haven't seen it, it it's a good show. And you'll enjoy it. Yeah, you see Hulk's naked ace. That's right. Which is what everyone has wanted. <laughs> All right, folks. Thanks for listening to today's show. I hope you had a good time. And uh, we'll be back again with some more of That Gets My Goat relatively soon. I'm actually going to I'm gonna force Rish to record another one as soon as we hit stop. So there you go. See ya. Good night.
Hulk here. That gets my goat produced under Creative Commons 3.0 non-commercial no derivatives license. That means feel free to listen to file, to share file, to smash file, but no selling, no taking credit for it. No touching file in inappropriate place, or Hulk find out about it. Oh.